play into this thing with eight ball. It's great to see you all, even like behind the mask, see some familiar faces. You know, that, that whole Florida over there about, about Long is very, very nice. Uh, and some of the uh, students, welcome to the Institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies here at Emmanuel College. Uh, we're starting up our fourth year in existence here at the uh, here at the Notre Dame uh, campus, and it's a really, really a uh, great pleasure, and I can uh, be more thankful to everybody who's in this room. Um, so, uh, you know, I just want to highlight some of the things that we've done over the last uh, four years, over the last year, and uh, then I'm also going to try to give you a little presentation and connecting uh, this historic place that we're in. I mean, this is a fairly historic place, uh, and really tied into the Mediterranean and tie it into uh, a celebration that's going on in, in Greece this year. This is a 200th anniversary, the bicentennial of the Declaration of, uh, of Independence for Greece in 1821, 25th of March. So this has been a, a year of commemoration, but you know, like everything else, the, the pandemic has really uh, changed things around. And there's such a connectivity to uh, what went on in Greece, to what's going on in Boston, and we'll touch a little bit on that, and then uh, I won't uh, bore you. And uh, there's some great music upstairs. And there's some food, and there's some wine. So it's more of a celebration uh, than anything else. And a thank you uh, to a whole bunch of people who are here. Um, and as you can see on your chairs, there's a little folder of the stuff that we have done. And inside, there's a, a little write-up of what uh, has transpired over the last few years. Uh, so here's a little video of that, and uh, we'll start there. Like I said, there are plenty of people here who uh, have helped over the years and still are helping. And uh, this year wouldn't have been possible without uh, the students. We, we raised all of our money 
Uh, and as you saw, the number 178,000, a lot more since then. <laughs> it's fine. It's a little bit, my little fast drop. Uh, we raised a lot more uh, this this year. Uh, people have been very, very, very generous. Uh, there are 16 students that are going to facilities trip uh, in March, and uh, we're going to start uh, talking about the, the summer program, which is uh, back on, and hopefully uh, we're all going to be safe with, uh, and during the pandemic. And, and, uh, so it's it's been a great, great experience. It's been a lot of fun, uh, and like I said, we're self-funded, uh, and it's it's great to see our great friends and supporters in, in the audience, and to be able to to thank. Every single one of you. There isn't a single person in this room that I think, uh, hasn't contributed to this, the success of this program. Uh, friends and, and students. This is completely student run. Uh, Natalie, Layla, Maria this year. Uh, Anthony, Nick now is coming on, and Cole, you know, and Sammy. And come on in. It's great to see you some uh, old faces behind the masks. Um, so it's 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 sort of like a, a, a fun thing, and you know, of course, uh, you know, they don't they don't like it, but the Power family has been uh, instrumental in, in, in what we've done in the last few years. Yanis and Linda Cazaros, very instrumental. Yanis was one of the first supporters uh, back in 2015. He supported the program every year, so it's uh, you know I can see every student who's here has been a part of this, and it's great to see. Some of the 145 students that have traveled to Greece since 2012. We're coming up to our 10th anniversary. So uh, I really want to thank you for the support. Uh, I, want to, I want to ask you to continue the support. And I, this is tonight, it's more of a thank you than anything else. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, one last thing before I do my presentation. In the room next door, um, there are four posters. And those are posters of research that students did this past summer. We funded uh, uh, 15 students. They did four different projects this past summer. During the pandemic, students worked on a project that had to do with Phil Hellenism in Boston. Uh, they looked at uh, Phil Hellenes that have been uh, buried either at Forest Hill Cemetery or Mount Auburn Cemetery, and the history of Boston and the history of, of Greece tied together. We also had a project on, on that's in, it's in the second year, uh, and Natalie and Matt have worked on this a uh, couple of years now, and it's tracking China's investment in the Mediterranean. So uh, we have been looking at that. Uh, Maria and um, and Brooke have been looking at the music of the Mediterranean, looking at the music of longing and belonging, the music of Senekia or Alorba in uh, in Arabic, and how that connects together. Uh, so we have been in the last, and the last but not least, the project that we started out this year, which has to do monitoring climate change and climate difference in the Mediterranean, including desertification and food insecurity. So uh, students have been involved. Uh, the entire program was funded uh, by uh, a very generous gift by George Dennis, who has been really a, a great supporter this, this year, supported by George e. Dennis' uh, diplomacy seminar that we did and has been a, a great, great uh, friend of the, of the program. So thank you again. Once I, we finish, you're free to look at the, the projects that students have done, and then make your way upstairs. There's some food, and there's some wine, and some um, music from the Mediterranean. So uh, when the when the idea of the of the institute came about, um, and the, you know, there was a the, there was a sense of like you know space for the institute, uh, I thought that um, being up here at, at NDC was like the, the perfect place for it, um, and I thought it was a perfect place for it because there's so much of the history here. Um, that really ties into to the Mediterranean, as obscure as that might be. And I couldn't think of a better opportunity than uh, this evening 
uh, to really uh, put some of these pieces together. My hope was that we would have a, a conference here uh, this weekend, but due to the pandemic and all other limitations, it wasn't necessarily uh, possible. So um, I'm just gonna talk about some, some of the things that really tie um, the idea that is uh, Greece with the idea that it is the United States. And in some ways, uh, they are so intertwined and they speak to us today. Um, the title of my uh, presentation is The Greek Revolution and the Redemption of the American Nation. And I use the term redemption on purpose uh, because they, I feel that uh, a lot of the politics of the early American period, uh, it's very religiously driven. And there's a great deal of competition as far as you know, the politics of Boston, the politics of the United States at this time, and the different themes. So this, this Boston and religious confrontations, political values and merchant interests, uh, but very much related to, to Boston itself. The whole idea of Philhellenism, which is a sort of like a, a, a strange term for me. It's a double-edged sword because it brings together this idea of American exceptionalism on the one end, a certain arrogance that comes with it, and the other side, the idea of the city on the hill, this notion that of redeeming, of helping people through. Um, and you have like different characters on each side. You know? This whole idea of you know, Lord Byron and how he inspires sort of this idea of looking for ancient Hellas and the ideals that are Hellenic values. And here in Boston, you know, Samuel Gridley Howe and how he embodies in practice that notion. He goes to Greece, he fights in Greece, uh, along with other uh, students from Brown, from Harvard, from other Ivy League schools. Um, and the story of Amherst College, I don't know how many people know the story of Amherst College, but Amherst College is a place where a lot of young kids from Greece come to become missionaries. There is this sort of like, you know, redemption, this Protestant redemption that takes place and a lot of the young orphans of the Greek war are brought here to New England and Amherst College in particular, over 40 of them. Um, and of course, Harvard itself, you know, Harvard College with its classics departments with Edward Everett and uh, the other Harvard presidents like Cornelius Felton or Sumner or even Longfellow really striving to this ideal that is Greece. But there's a flip side to that, right? And the flip side to that is the fact that this democratic values are portrayed in Greece. It's sort of like a looking in the mirror here in the United States. How democratic are we, right? And there are two issues in particular that I'm gonna talk about this evening that really speak to this. One is the issue of slavery and the abolitionist movement. And the other is the issue of women's right to vote and the suffrage movement, which are both inspired by what's going on in Greece in one way or another, on both camps, on both camps, whether you believe in this American exceptionalism or whether you believe in this city on the hill notion of the city of the issue of redemption. And one in particular that I focus on is this whole idea, I believe, that the lightning rod, which is Hiram Powers, um, Hiram Powers um, statue of the slave girl. I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with the slave girl, this Hiram Powers, you will be. <laughs> and I, I apologize for the pornographic material. You know them. So I, I start out with this religious aspect. Uh, there is a second Protestant awakening that starts at the, uh, with the creation of the United States, the, the sort of a departure from the Puritan values. And you know, on one side you have this Congregationalist, which are really a continuity of the Puritan values. And on the other end, you have the Episcopalians, this reform now Anglicans who have become Episcopalians. But they both have the same zeal. They both want to implant Protestant values in a Christian land, namely Greece itself. They view Greece as a backward Christianity, and it has to be redeemed in a, in a different way. Um, so this religious and political debate of Boston is transferred, is transferred over to, uh, to Greece itself. Um, so this is Theodore Tulato's argument, a lesser known but perhaps significant phase of American religious reformism manifested itself beginning with the 1820s. Remember, 1821, the Greek uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, when missionaries attempted to graft Protestantism on Greek soil, 
the spiritual reformers prepared to plant their faith in Greece, while Samuel Gridley Howe, Jonathan Miller, George Jarvis sought to help the Greeks win their independence from the, from the Turks. This winning of the independence from the Turks had to do with this whole notion of rediscovering Hellas, ancient Hellas. And this was really problematic, as I mentioned, because this was a, a missionary activity which was extraordinary for Americans because they were attempting to impose Christianity on a Christian state. This was not some kind of a non-Christian state that they were imposing this to. So uh, here's some examples of this. Of course, Byron and Shelley uh, traveled to Greece. Romantics take part in the war for civilization against barbarism. As the children of ancient Hellas, uh, they, you know, they write this poem to Mother Corvatus, who is a, a prominent uh, Greek politician and a diplomat. Uh, and the world's great age begins anew, the golden years return, referring back to ancient Athens. The earth doth like a snake renew her winter weeds outworn. Heaven smiles and faints and empires gleam like wrecks of dissolving dream. This is this whole idea of redeeming from barbarism the civilized. So this is the one strand that I uh, talk about. And of course, this is towards the, the end of the century. Uh, this is a poem by uh, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow. The three friends of mine that he's speaking of are Felton, Sumner, and Agassiz. Now, Agassiz is being taken down by the way in these days because she sort of like, you know, thought that um, there, was a, there was a different time that people of color were created as opposed to uh, white people. But the idea of Wordsworth and Sumner and, and, and Felton and the rest of the Harvard elite was this idea of a Greece that was redeeming the rest of the world and civilizing in a completely different way. There's a geopolitical dimension. I'm simply going to touch upon it because if it's geopolitics, I can talk about it for a while. Right? So here it goes. Um, uh, Iron Perkins is a well to do Bostonian who makes a lot of money in the slave trade until 1794 when Haiti stops the slave trade. So the next best thing to slaves is opium. Where does opium come from? Smyrna, uh, Smyrna in the Ottoman Empire. So in the 1820s, the biggest challenge for the United States foreign policy, and for some of you who follow Greek foreign policy today, to so take note of this, is that although there was an overwhelming support for the Greek cause, John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, and James Monroe wanted to have a trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire. And Taking the side of the Greeks would have really created a problem. So the American fleet is sent to safeguard the passage of US merchant ships, primarily Perkins ships, right? Uh, Perkins makes a lot of money in the opium trade. He's one of two brothers. Uh, and he is responsible for Mass General Hospital, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Athenaeum, and most of the buildings that go back to the early 19th century, Boston, okay? On the flip side of that is the USS Constitution, which is one of the, the ships that is in Greece at the time from 1824 all the way to 1828. And the drive by people like Edward Everett, Web Daniel Webster, who are arguing for the redemption of the Greeks. So on one side, you have this national drive this geopolitical drive on the other side, this issue of values. And even somebody like John Quincy Adams, who has like illustrious career, who becomes, eventually becomes president and he goes to Congress, you know, uh, 40 years later, as the, you know, we're, we're dealing with a civil war, he changes his position on some of these issues, you know, everybody's seen the movie. Okay, so that's the While this is going on, here comes the flip side of this. This guy, David Walker, he's a free uh, former slave. He's a free man. His mother was free, so he is a free man. And he writes in 1829 an appeal, a four article appeal of colored people across the globe. And he is, this is a very caustic kind of a, uh, 
on the statement that he's making because he's taking the Greek case and he's saying, hey, if it's okay for the Greeks to overthrow a tyrant and slavery is bad for the Greeks, why not for us, right? So this is a quote from a newspaper that he's read. He says, I saw a paragraph speaking of the barbarity of the Turks. The Turks are the most barbarous people in the world. They treat the Greeks more like brutes than human beings. And in the same paper was an advertisement which said, eight well-built Virginia and Maryland Negro fellows and four wenches will positively be sold to the highest bid. I declare it is really so amusing to hear the Southerners talk about barbarity. So you have the both arguments that really get inspired by the same event, namely the Greek War of Independence. This is the uh, this is the, uh, the pamphlet. I got it. Sorry about that. Uh, -huh. uh no, the charter came out. I could make my new profile. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pamphlet by uh, by David Walker. Uh, it's a pretty amazing uh, statement, 1829. And even William Lloyd Garrison uh, writes about it in his newspaper, The Liberator. Now, welcome to Rockledge. <laughs> Where's Rockledge? Where we are right now, right? This is it. This is where we are right now. So this is what this place was called, Rockledge. Uh, it was built sometime in the 1840s, maybe 1850s. William Lloyd Garrison comes here in 1864 and dies in 1879. He didn't die here, but he died in New York. But you know, this was his home at the time. He's now buried at um, uh, Forest Hill Cemetery, which we discovered this summer um, as part of the project that we were doing. William Lloyd Garrison, uh, interesting fellow, um, 25 years old. He 22 years old, he gets involved in publishing a newspaper in Baltimore. And 25 years old, he begins the liberator. Early young guy. And he is sort of like, you know, a fire, firebrand. He, he really uh, takes on something, some of the Walker arguments. He's very much influenced by Walker. And he takes a very strong position on uh, slavery. He becomes a member of the American Colonization Society. And then he becomes a member of the American Anti-Slavery Society, for some of you who don't know. The American Colonization Society was the idea that was pushed by many that uh, blacks and whites should not be together, they should not amalgamate. The word for integration back then was amalgamation. And even people like Madison were arguing for once blacks were freed, they should be sent to a place called Liberia, right? So they should do the, so that was part of like the abolition movement. And William Lloyd Garrison for a brief while, for a couple of years, he's a member of that. And then he becomes the, the founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1830. Uh, as I said, you know, it's really amazing that he is, you know, 25 years of age when he's when he's doing this. So, you know, he's sort of like, you know, and this is the liberator. I find this also fascinating as you have this uh, Christ figure in the middle and the white person sort of like, you know, uh, the light is too bright while the, uh, the, 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 the Black person is, is sort of like redeemed. And I, I found him fascinating because he looks almost similar to the statue of Lincoln that was taken down in the Fine Park Plaza earlier in the year. Right? Same kind of a, um, where, the, where the Lincoln was Christ and all. Higher powers. This is the most popular statue piece of art of the 19th century. Right? The Greek slave. Uh, he's in Florence. He puts this together based on what he's seen of antiquity. Um, and it's sort of like this, uh, they, this this girl from Chios whose family is massacred and she is traded at a bazaar, a slave uh, bazaar in, uh, in Istanbul. So he is, you know, putting this together. This is displayed throughout the United States. The multiples of this, people had them in their homes. Uh, this was a very popular image. This was the kind of a thing of redeeming, you know, uh, this young woman, uh, this young Christian woman, she has a cross on her bracelet and you can't see it. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, this is the, the first sort of like nude statue of the 19th century, right? And 
it's displayed everywhere. It's displayed here in the Boston Common. Uh, and it, it has all kinds of different uh, effects. Uh, just so like, you know, it's gaining support for the, for the Greeks. There's six different versions of this throughout the 19th century. The last one being done immediately after the Civil War. Um, of course, it had a counter effect. Those people who admired and they were like, you know, rallied to the point of, of the Greeks. Uh, but they, you know, people very quickly saw the duplicity and hypocrisy in this. Uh, this is from Punch Magazine, uh, the Virginian slave, uh, sort of like, you know, really making a statement about slavery here in this country. And then the daughter of Eve, which is the uh, statue on the right, also sort of like, you know, bringing a poignant reminder of here, you know, what's going on here in, in the United States at the time. This is the 1840s. Uh, in 1851, there's a demonstration in Crystal Palace. Yeah, there's an exhibition in England and uh, former uh, American uh, slaves demonstrate and uh, put a, a, a cloth around the, uh, the actual uh, statue of the, um, of the slave girl. But that's one side. The other side is the issue of suffrage, women's right to vote. And um, for the most part, at the beginning of the 19th century, most women's groups were sort of like the widows of the Revolutionary War. They were just like providing support for families who lost uh, people. And with the Greek Revolution, women began to feel that there was a global sense of the same victimhood across the globe. And there was a, an awareness of global politics. It wasn't just like pertain there. So you have this, the Greek Revolution again becomes this, this motivation for uh, an issue of really redemption on part of the of, of, of American society. Two sides of this argument as well. On one side, you have Emma Hart Willard. Uh, she's from Troy, New York. Uh, she likes the idea of Troy, New York because it's, it's reminiscent of Troy of antiquity. She starts the first women's uh, seminary of uh, you know teaching women how to read, write, uh, being educated as a global citizen. And Emma Hart Willard goes to Greece and starts the Hart School, which is the first private school in Greece, still in operation. And actually, the latest latest prime minister Tsipras's children go went to school there. Okay, so it's still like a a, a school in in, in practice. Uh, the, the notion of the hard school is to really uh, educate and to really uh, clean uh, individuals to be able to move to uh, civilization. And there's the, the effect of the Hiram Powers uh, statue, a contemporary Harriet of uh, Hiram Powers, Harriet Hosmer. Uh, she has a statue, she's another sculptor, a statue of Zenobia which is to illustrate not only slavery, but to illustrate the strength of women. Zenobia, who is a queen of Palmyra in 247 AD and survives a Roman uh, slavery and really uh, not only is able to survive, but she looks men away, which is she's an she's a image of, of, of female strength, not an issue of, of you know, women that need the protection of men. On the other side of, of this argument, is Lucy Stone. How many people have heard of Lucy Stone? Lucy Stone is the first woman that got a college degree from Massachusetts in 1847. Nobody would hire Lucy Stone except one person. Can you guess that one person? William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison is the only man that hired, uh, hired her. And in 1848, uh, Lucy Stone goes to the Boston Commons sees the statue of Hiram Powers, and this is her reaction, right? Her reaction is not that she was just like, you know, looking at women being uh, powerless in, 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 in Greece, uh, but she was saying that the hot tears came to my eyes at, at the thought of, million, of millions of women who have been, who must be freed. Uh, the Greek slave was an emotional point of reminder, not only of the status of women in war-torn Greece, but also of women in Stone's own country, okay? So the inspiration, not only of the, 
of the people that are looking to the suffrage movement in a within an institutional manner, but women who were radicalized by that statute as well. And this is Lucy Stone, and as I as I mentioned to you, she is you know she's the first woman that uh, graduates uh, college, gets a college degree. It, she's almost thirty years old when she does it, and she is you know she really uh, fights uh, to get the, the degree. Julia Ward Howe, Battle Hymn of the Republic, Julia Ward Howe, um, also within that same period. But, you know, as you can see, uh, these movements were not necessarily moving one way. And uh, she published a, a, a memoir of a trip to Cuba. And, but she really brings up the whole idea that she doesn't believe in racial uh, equality, which is, you could have been a feminist, but maybe not necessarily. Uh, an abolitionist in, in the full sense of the of the idea. Nonetheless, Julia Ward Howe is also somebody who is inspired by the Greek Revolution. Of course, her husband, uh, uh, Samuel Ridley Howe, uh, a very uh, strong uh, presence in, in the Philhellenic uh, movement uh, in Greece as well. This is uh, Frederick Douglass's study when he passes away in the 1890s. Uh, and you can see there is a statue of um, of a slave girl, the Greek slave girl. At the beginning, uh, he was he was opposed to to the Greek slave girl, but eventually, um, he there's a Greek slave girl in both his uh, his office in Haiti and in his study uh, here in, in the U.S. Now, what has happened? What has happened over time is. Hiram Power, somebody who started out as being uh, anti-abolitionist in, 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 in some ways, uh, he changes. And if you look at this statue, this is the, the sixth rendition after the Civil War. The shackles are, are those shackles that uh, American uh, slaves have and not the shackles of, you know, the, the Greek slave had way back when. So the, the Greek slave has morphed into, uh, you know, the, the really characterize the um, the movement of, of the abolitionist movement here in the United States. I'm finishing up. So. <laughs> so what's this redemption of a nation, right? Um, the, my, the argument here is that there's a, there was a romantic fascination with Greece, with ancient Athens, and it was it was a fascination that was needed for the exceptionalism of the nation that was the nation state that was emerging. You needed that fascination in order to merge together this idea of each nation state being so exceptional to the point of providing the linkage to, to the past. Uh, however, in order for you to be redeemed in the democratic sense, you need to have two elements that are part of the freedom of speech. Isigoria and Parisia. The ability to have a voice, but the ability to also say whatever you want. Okay? We see that in order for those values, the American values, to fully be democratic and to fully be adopted, they had to incorporate the radicalism in quotations. I'm not going to do the hand thing because I don't like it. Right? <laughs> the radicalism of a Walker, the radicalism of a, a Lloyd Garrison, even the radicalism of Lucy Stone in order for you to fulfill the entire process. Okay. I'm, I'm finishing. So in definition, there is a conflict between what the ancient Greeks called Isigoria on one hand and Parisia on the other. It's the oldest democracy itself. Today, both terms are often translated as freedom of speech, but their meanings were, were and are importantly distinct. In ancient Athens, Isigoria described the equal right of citizens to participate in public debate in the democratic assembly, Parisia, the license to say what one pleased, how and when one pleased and to whom, which I think is very, very important, especially today, when really the issue of like, you know, how much we can hear and what we're hearing is, is sort of like filtered. Okay. So democracy is the redemption of the nation. Thank you very much.